President Trump is getting ready to head to Europe right now. You're watching live as they're in Tel Aviv. Marine One has touched down. He'll make the transfer over to Air Force One. It is called that once he is on board. As the president, the commander in chief, he will lift off. You can see Israeli officials there waiting uh, to bid him adieu. You can see the prime minister and his wife, President Rivlin, as well. As Marine One taxis across the tarmac there in Tel Aviv. Uh, and we are going to watch and wait as we uh, see this historic trip, the first international trip for the president. He will head from here to Rome, eventually going on to meet with the Pope. We imagine that will be a very interesting conversation. I'm joined today uh, by Eric Sean. It's been an historic trip. So far, Eric, and much more to come. It has been, Shannon. Good morning, and good morning, everyone. Uh, a successful trip being praised, unfortunately, and so tragically in the shadow of the unspeakable carnage that we all witnessed overnight with that horrible attack on the Ariana Grande concert that has taken so many young lives. That, of course, touching the theme that the president had on this trip of fighting against terrorism, against the culture, against the payments by the Palestinian Authority, to terrorists and families of terrorists, the PA spends $300 million a year, 8% of its budget, uh, critics say, rewarding terrorists and those families, uh, Palestinians, the president referring to that in his uh, speech earlier uh, this morning in Jerusalem. Clearly a change of culture, behavior, and motive he is calling for in the Muslim world. And we saw him over the weekend with the uh, remarks he gave in Saudi Arabia and, the, and also the opening there of that huge counterterrorism uh, intelligence area where they're going to try to combat where so much of this is happening and that is online but he's talked about and the administration has talked about giving hope to the population there throughout the Middle East which tends to be younger especially in Saudi Arabia uh, giving those people hope uh, for an economic future for other options so that they are not so easily swayed uh, by ideologies that would seek to capitalize on their despair to radicalize them and to equip them, of course, ISIS this morning now claiming responsibility for what happened in Manchester, saying this person was a soldier of the caliphate uh, carrying out this bombing at a concert in an exit area where people would be leaving. Uh, as it stands right now, 22 dead, uh, 59 or so others injured. Some of them, we are um, told, critically injured. We heard remarks from British Prime Minister Theresa May this morning not backing down. The president saying, we stand with the U.K., and again, Eric, as you said, it's, it follows on this theme of what he's been saying throughout the Middle East region, too, uh, that people have to step up and to flush these terrorists out, that we will not bow to them, we will not bend to them. And the president today using interesting language, calling them losers. We know there's a lot of psychology that feeds into the way that the White House to the president refers uh, to these individuals. And uh, a very specific term he used this morning, Eric. Oh, so often they are young men. Uh, who seem to be alienated somehow from society, who have been radicalized, whether it's through directly ISIS or Al-Qaeda or another terrorist, Islamic terrorist group of radical Islamic terrorism, or just uh, uh, spun out because of the economic difficulties, according to some. And one of the parts of this trip that is so interesting, the president as a businessman hailed, of course, uh, not as a politician, but talking about empowerment in the Palestinian territories. There was a call uh, similar to the Marshall Plan for what is called a Trump Plan to try to encourage and empower the economic uh, fortunes of the younger people in uh, some of the Arab states as well as in the Palestinian territory to potentially prevent some of the radicalization that we have so tragically seen uh, recently and especially with what's happening in Manchester, England. And again, if you're just joining us, you're looking at Marine One in Tel Aviv, Israel. As the president uh, taxis toward Air Force One, he will take off there and head to Rome. That'll be his next touchdown on this trip, which takes him also uh, to NATO, to Brussels, on to Sicily as well. So uh, it is a wide-ranging nine-day trip. For a lot of people, uh, they say it's changing the conversation a bit because there's so much domestically going on for this administration, both positive and negative, uh, dealing with fallout uh, from the firing of Director James Comey, FBI director, and also the uh, decision now we have from former National Security Advisor. It was a brief stint, just 24 days, but General Michael Flynn saying it will not comply with the Senate subpoena from the Senate Intelligence Committee, asking him for documents as they continue their investigation into Russia. Uh, also back here at home, we're going to hear more today. There are a couple of hearings in both the House, the Senate, the House GOP leadership will also hold a press conference. They want to talk about things like tax reform, uh, that health care reform measure. Uh, now the Senate debating its own version, working on that.
Um, and also this budget, the president's budget rolls out this morning. And so there's a lot going on domestically. And interestingly enough, we talked about yesterday that the New York Times actually had some words of praise, it sounded like, for the president saying during this trip, he's been very disciplined. He stayed on message. He's been diplomatic. He's been calm. And for the most part, has stayed away uh, from Twitter. There have been a few things, most of them um, positive and, um, you know, highlighting the trip. Uh, thus far and the highlights of the trip. So, um, you know, he's getting some praise from this trip and maybe it will at least temporarily, Eric, help him change the narrative. Well, it seems that he is beginning to change the conversation, uh, not only with Israel uh, and the Palestinians, but also with the coalition of Sunni Arab allies and the Gulf states. This is something completely new, uh, attaching Israel with the Sunni Arab allies in a, uh, a crescent against Tehran and the uh, influence and extremism that we have seen coming out of Iran uh, for all these many years. So perhaps potentially on the verge of a new breakthrough in the Middle East, we'll only see how this can play out. And you were talking about uh, some of the controversies a moment ago. Uh, also, there's the new allegation today that the president tried to ask NSA Director Mike Rogers and DNI Chief Dan Coates. Uh, to ask them to s publicly say there was no collusion with the R Russians. They, according to the reports, backing away from that, saying they no, they won't do that. And they'll be up on the Hill uh, a mm -hmm. little or later on this morning uh, testifying. So we'll see if that they delve into that question. So clearly, uh, these domestic issues and the controversies and crises continuing uh, to, uh, in some way, uh, overshadow some of the trip. Uh, but of course, the uh, major issue today, the issue of terrorism, radical Islamic terrorism and how the world, how the Arab world can fight against that. Mm -hmm. And we're looking now live, you see the president and first lady as they are walking over to Air Force One. Also Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump, uh, the son-in-law and daughter of the president. And this has been a very meaningful trip for them as well. Uh, and seeing them uh, see the deep roots of their Jewish faith and all four of them visiting the Western Wall yesterday and uh, with Ivanka and her husband. Uh, for them, it, you've seen a, a solemnity to this trip as well. And this morning as they were uh, remembering the Holocaust and the president laying a wreath and, and remarking just about how deep the ties between these two countries are. Let's listen in. And that will continue as he meets the Holy Father, the Pontiff at the Vatican, 2 a.m. Eastern time. that there has been a real affinity between these two couples, the Trumps and the Netanyahu's. Um, we saw the first ladies yesterday at a hospital visit uh, during our hours here on America's Newsroom. And just seeing the relationship develop between the two of them, um, they've seemed to have a lot of mutual admiration and praise for each other. And again, um, watching President Trump and Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu together, um, you see in them a real, it, it appears, bond and camaraderie that they're on the same page about things that matter like Iran.
on, uh, like the threat of terrorism, the threats in that region and beyond. Uh, and we know that the Iran nuclear deal was a real source of tension for Israel uh, with the last administration, with President Obama. Uh, and uh, we've heard continually from the prime minister that he feels a new sense of hope uh, for this relationship and for the U.S. commitment to Israel. Uh, the prime minister telling me last July when I interviewed him at the prime minister's office in Jerusalem uh, that he wants to test Iran to make sure that they are fulfilling the requirements of the nuclear deal, even though uh, he, you know, basically uh, opposed uh, what the Obama administration was doing. But you have to also remember, not only are they on the same page with Iran, they go back decades because uh, Mr. Netanyahu was the U.N. ambassador in the 1980s when uh, uh, Donald Trump first built Trump Tower. So they have <laughs> known each other for a good 30, 40 years uh, through all these years in New York at events. So it is a bond that is both personal and, in some sense, political, as you say, on the same page. Yeah, and then we see a hug there between Ivanka Trump, uh, who is a senior advisor, White House advisor, uh, as well as being a daughter to the president. Her husband, Jared Kushner, also taking on a, a very prominent role in this administration and has been tasked with working on getting Middle East peace efforts moving. So you see the young couple now speaking with the Netanyahu's as well. Uh, clearly a, a lot of affection uh, among them as well. It is uh, a big job for someone in their early 30s, uh, but the president has invested a lot of confidence in Jared Kushner and others uh, to begin to reattempt this, this dialogue. And the White House managing expectations on this trip, saying, we don't expect to come out of this with any grand announcement or agreement, but what we want to do is to make sure that we um, open the lines of communications. The president, again, with Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas this morning, saying, I have assurances from both sides now uh, that they are willing to work towards peace. They are serious about it. We know this has been attempted so many times uh, in the past, but the president hoping that this trip will give new life to that effort. There's been talk of incremental steps, uh, not dealing with the broad issues uh, of the 67 lines, for example, right of refugees to return, uh, East Jerusalem and uh, Jerusalem as the capital, but small incremental baby steps. Uh, perhaps dealing with the uh, Palestinian uh, funding of uh, terrorist families, perhaps dealing with uh, uh, stopping the settlement building uh, by Israel, that if there can be some meetings of the minds in some of the s smaller areas, that can then lead to a broader peace. And now we will say goodbye to the president as he heads from here to Rome, ultimately to uh, new tasks and new New meetings there abroad, and we'll keep an eye on the coverage, of course, and bring you there. Everything live as it happens. And this is a Fox News alert. Now, uh, ISIS reportedly claiming responsibility for a bombing that has left the country and a whole world stunned. 22 people are dead at a Manchester arena and dozens more hurt in the deadliest attack in Britain in more than a decade. Good morning. I'm Shannon Breen. Welcome to America's Newsroom, and welcome to you today eric joining Thank us you, as well Shannon. on this solemn day with this unspeakable act i'm eric sean and football hammer this morning we can tell you that an arrest has been made it happened early this morning in that attack that unfolded in a flash oh my god what's going on what's going on That horrible explosion just as the Ariana Grande concert was ending inside that packed arena in Manchester. As you can see, it was filled with families and children and parents waiting for their kids to come out. The shock sending people scrambling, of course, for the exits in panic. Many parents rushing to get in to find their children who were still inside. So here's what we know so far. At least 22 are dead, 59. Nine more hurt, some of them critically. Investigators believe a suicide bomber detonated a single improvised explosive device near the entrance to the arena just as concert goers were flooding out. And earlier this morning, British Prime Minister Theresa May said police believe they do know the attacker's identity, but they are not publicly disclosing that at this time. 
Manchester police also have arrested a 23-year-old man in connection to this attack, but we don't know the charges as of now. Yeah, and as we told you a little bit earlier, ISIS is claiming responsibility. That's the report. So now listen to some people who were inside the arena describing how quickly this all turned so chaotic. The bang went seemed to come from the back left and then suddenly you just heard screaming and everybody was running from the back towards the front um, and it was, just, it was just sheer chaos. People tried to get off the balconies. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was awful. Everything kind of went calm for about five or six seconds. I mean everyone in the arena was just... It was scary, Quiet. scarily Quiet. still. Yeah. And then and all of a sudden that was it. There was pandemonium everywhere. The attack, of course, coming only hours before the president arrives in Europe and for his meeting at the Vatican with the, with the pontiff. And speaking earlier this morning in Jerusalem, the president said the innocent people were murdered by what he called evil losers. Dozens of innocent people, beautiful young children, savagely murdered in this heinous attack. Upon humanity, I repeat again that we must drive out the terrorists and the extremists from our midst, obliterate this evil ideology, and protect and defend our citizens and people of the world. And look at this headline, it just simply sums this up killing our kids. We have got Fox Team covered. Kristen Fisher live at the White House, but we begin with Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harridge live in Washington. Good morning, Catherine. Well, thank you, Shannon. A U.S. government official says the investigation is focused on the suspected suicide bomber and their close network of associates. They are hopeful a review of the forensic evidence, the improvised explosive device, as well as security. Security camera video will reveal whether the suspect acted alone or had a support network with terrorist groups, as Manchester's chief constable explained earlier. The priority is to establish whether he was acting alone or as part of a network. The attacker, I can confirm, died at the arena. We believe the attacker was carrying an improvised explosive device which he detonated, causing this atrocity. We would ask people not to speculate on his details or share names. This is a complex and wide-ranging investigation. Authorities are working with the name, but this morning they are not ready to confirm it publicly. The British Prime Minister condemned the murders as callous. All acts of terrorism are cowardly attacks on innocent people but this attack stands out for its appalling sickening cowardice deliberately targeting innocent defenseless children and young people the US government official told Fox News that the attack shows a level of sophistication beyond recent UK based plots involving knives and vehicles as weapons The use of shrapnel and the apparent targeting of the venue exit also show premeditation because a closed space amplifies the concussive effect of the explosion, the disfiguring impact of shrapnel, and that will maximize casualties, Shannon. Yeah, certainly some planning mm -hmm. went into this one. Okay, so what are we learning, Catherine, about this claim of responsibility? Well, according to the intelligence group that tracks terrorist groups worldwide, the Islamic State has claimed responsibility, stating it was carried out with an explosive device that was planted at the concert venue. This claim was posted on one of these media apps called Telegram. Fox News is working to get more independent corroboration on that claim. Meantime, on recent chatter, the U.S. government official said Islamic terror groups have maintained a steady call to hit so-called soft targets, such as concert halls, as well as civilians. In a statement, Homeland Security said there was no credible threat to venues inside the U.S., but folks can expect increased security for some time, Shannon. All right, Catherine Harris, live force in Washington.
Thank you. You're welcome. Well, this horrible and unspeakable terrorist attack occurred only moments after pop star Ariana Grande had left the stage. She was not injured, we're told, and she tweeted this. Broken. From the bottom of my heart, I am so sorry. I don't have words. We're also now learning the rest of her tour has been suspended indefinitely, and that clearly understandable. And we're also learning that the very first victim to be identified had actually met Ariana Grande. 18-year-old Georgina Callender posted this picture. It was taken two years ago online before last night's concert. She said she was, quote, so excited to see the pop star again. Meanwhile, some Manchester residents are opening their homes to suffering victims from the explosion. They're using the Twitter hashtag Room for Manchester to let those in need. They've got a place to stay. Local hotels also taking part in that movement. And those offers reportedly started almost immediately after news of the bombing. And our Team Fox coverage continues uh, with reaction from the president, as we saw. Uh, a few moments ago, he has wrapped up his visit to Israel. Air Force One, as you can see now, at Ben-Gurion Airport, taxiing, ready to take off to head to Europe. Uh, he met earlier today with the Palestinian leader, Mahmoud Abbas, that occurring in Bethlehem. And he had some strong words against this Manchester attack. Here with more, Kristen Fisher, who was live at the White House with more on what the president had to say. Good morning, Kristen. Hey, good morning, Eric. Well, President Trump has already spoken out and condemned these attacks twice this morning, once with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Jerusalem, the other with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in Bethlehem. And both times he echoed the same message that he's been saying since he touched down in Saudi Arabia three days ago that the Arab world must come together to fight terrorism. He also had this message for what he called the, quote, evil losers behind the attack in Manchester. Listen. I won't call them monsters because they would like that term. They would think that's a great name. I will call them, from now on, losers, because that's what they are. They're losers. Now, this morning, President Trump also spoke on the phone with Britain's Prime Minister Theresa May. The White House says that the two leaders agreed that this attack on primarily young children, their Mothers uh, attending a concert uh, was particularly gruesome, and they agreed to talk about it more when they meet in just a few days at the NATO summit in Brussels. Eric. All right, Kristen, uh, just uh, so horrific and beyond comprehension. Thank you. Shannon. Well, our live coverage of the Manchester bombing continues all morning long as prayers and condolences are now flooding in for the victims from around the world. And in Manchester, the terror investigation is just beginning. What kind of support did the suicide bomber have? Could it happen here in the U.S.? And President Trump says the United States stands with the United Kingdom today and with the whole world in our shared challenge to rid our globe of terrorism once and for all. All civilized nations must be united in this effort. This trip is focused on that goal, bringing nations together around the goal of defeating the terrorism that threatens the world. This meeting took place on this very horrible morning of death to innocent young people. Peace can never take root in an environment where violence is tolerated, funded, and even rewarded. That, of course, was President Trump on his meeting earlier this morning with Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas. That is news broke of that horrible attack in Manchester. It has killed so far at least 22 people and so many of them children.
The president in his meeting reinforcing that Middle Eastern nations and the U.S. have a common objective to wipe out terrorism, but he met with a leader whose very own organization is paying terrorists and their families with hundreds of millions of dollars for those acts. John Bolton joins us from Tampa, former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Fox News contributor, senior fellow with the American Enterprise Institute and chairman of the Gatestone Institute here in New York. Ambassador, how can terrorism really end when the Palestinian Authority shells out $300 million a year basically to support it? Or the president just referenced those payments, and they call them their so-called martyr payments. Well, the, the short answer is that it won't end. And in fact, this is part of the problem, I think, uh, as you think about this, 15 and a half years after the 9-11 attacks on New York and Washington, when we thought we had a national resolve to put an end to this problem, uh, we're still seeing the tragedies that we've uh, just encountered in Manchester and England. We still see this problem with the Palestinians. Uh, and I think we, uh, somewhere along the way, we lost our willpower uh, to do what we had uh, sort of agreed to do after 9-11, which is to do whatever was necessary to destroy the terrorists. How, how, how can the culture, how can the, not us, but how can the culture then, with them, how can that culture change that radicalizes young men like apparently occurred here in Manchester, especially in which uh, the Palestinian Authority is paying, rewarding. It's a reward system that if you kill an Israeli or someone else, your family gets paid money for that act. Well, I think one thing you don't do is dignify the Palestinian Authority as a partner in peace, something that's been uh, tried and uh, which has failed for close to 50 years now, uh, because they're not going to be a partner for peace. This, this idea that uh, you can negotiate between the Palestinian leadership and Israel and create a Palestinian state that will not be a haven for terrorists, I think is a delusion. But I think the broader problem is the United States has lost its way in leadership. Now, it's possible that we're seeing a uh, return to American leadership. Certainly, the president's rhetoric points in that direction. Uh, but the fact is, we have to Remember again the idea that uh, that we had after 9/11 that the way to destroy the terrorists is to kill them. So what is the president them, not not to do not to do nation building? Well, what does the president say? I mean, he sat with Abbas. He referenced those payments. I'm thinking of the case of Taylor Force. Taylor was a 28-year-old uh, West Point graduate. That's Taylor right there. He's he went to Vanderbilt Business School. Well, he's walking in Tel Aviv with his friends, and a Palestinian terrorist comes out and starts knifing them. Twelve injured. Taylor was knifed to death. And now there is a bill in Congress to cut off some of the Palestinian payments unless they stop their payments. I mean, what, what do we do? Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said that if the Manchester uh, attacker was a Palestinian, he would get paid for this. Yeah, well, I think uh, cutting off the funds of the Palestinian Authority is a good step. I think defunding the UN refugee agency, UNRWA, uh, in the Middle East would be a good step because Palestinian refugee status is hereditary. They're the only hereditary refugees in the world. There are a lot of things that could be done, but what it requires is breaking with longstanding conventional wisdom. And uh, that hasn't happened yet. It may happen. I certainly hope that it does. But until we do that, until we take decisive steps, uh, this infrastructure that supports terrorism with, with our consent, in effect, with our implicit consent, will simply continue. And sadly, it is continuing as we see uh, those payments are continuing. Uh, one Democrat, we're told, supports that bill, Grace Ming of New York, as it sits in the House waiting for some action. Ambassador John Bolton, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Eric. And this is Fox News Alert. We're awaiting a hearing. 
threatened by the Senate Armed Services Committee on Worldwide Threats in the wake of last night's deadly attack in Great Britain. And it's no secret that Europe has become a popular target for terrorists with hundreds of militants coming back from war zones and right into those nations every year. What can be done to stop it from happening again as the news continues to come in? We'll keep you updated. All right, well, Fox's alert for you. The Senate Intelligence Committee holding a hearing now on the worldwide threats of terrorism. The featured witness, Director of National Intelligence Dan Coach. You see uh, Senator John McCain there beginning his opening statements. Well, the Washington Post this morning and yesterday had a report that President Trump asked Mr. Coates to help him refute the allegations of Russian collusion. Also apparently asked uh, Mike Rogers uh, about that too. You can be sure that that lightning issue will be raised, but this is happening as we are also learning More about the horrific bombing at the concert in Manchester. That is where Greg Palkite is, Palkite is with the very latest. Hi, Greg. Hi, Eric. Uh, that's right. Uh, I think you and our viewers know that I've covered way too many terror attacks all across Europe. But this is looking like maybe the worst, the most horrendous. They're right up there anyway. Not because of the style of the attack. Not because of the number killed. But... The victims killed. We're talking about children. We're talking about teenagers, young girls going out to have a, a great time to, to watch one of their favorite pop stars. Instead, ending up in a bloodbath. Uh, Prime Minister Theresa May is usually very stoic in her pronouncements, but she was quite emotional today. She said, and I quote, this attack stands out in its cowardice. It is done with a maximum amount of carnage. And of course, we're talking about those targeted. 22 killed, 59 injured, about 19 of them in critical condition in hospitals all over the Manchester area. Many of them, again, children, teenagers. Also, 60 people, 60 young people probably treated at the scene. Here's a bit more of what Prime Minister Theresa May had to say. We struggle to comprehend the warped and twisted mind that sees a room packed with young children not as a scene to cherish, but as an opportunity for carnage. ISIS has claimed responsibility. That's why the police here are looking hard for any kind of support network for this suicide bomber who did that carnage. There was one arrest. It's not clear whether there was a connection. But we also know there's a lot of people still looking for lost loved ones, missing children, missing teenagers, parents trying to connect with the folks they love. Very emotional scene here in Manchester, England today. Back to you, Eric. Just so heartbreaking. Greg, thank you. Shannon. Well, the U.K. is dealing with a number of critical terror issues, specifically the return of foreign fighters to their shores. Roughly 850 British citizens have reportedly traveled to Syria to support ISIS and other terror groups. And as of this, as of this past February, roughly half have likely returned home. At least 200 others have either been killed, convicted, or remain in the Middle East. It's a growing issue now. Gardner is the director of the Margaret Thatcher. Center for Reform, as well as a Bernard and Barbara Lomas fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Michael Waltz is a former Green Beret commander, a former counterterror advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney, and a Fox News contributor. Welcome to you both. Good to see you this morning. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, I'll start with you. Uh, it's no secret that ICE has been encouraging uh, people around the globe to go after soft targets, places like sporting events, concerts like this. Uh, um, is it possible for authorities to secure all those locations? Well, Shannon, you know, as a father, this makes me sick. It's one thing to go after civilians. It's another thing to go after children. Tactically, in this case, you know, the suicide bomber placed himself 
outside of the security barrier, but at a choke point and inside where they would maximize the explosive effect of the suicide bomb. There's no doubt in my mind that there's a cell behind this bomber, both to produce the bomb and also to guide them into the location. You know, strategically, this underscores President Trump's trip and his particularly his speech in Riyadh where he pinned the rose on the broader Muslim community to stop this from within. It also goes to the military angle here where we cannot allow these sanctuaries to fester. We just had our Navy SEALs hit Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen. Last night mm -hmm. we've got a troop increase in Afghanistan and of course we have Syria. And then, of course, you know, to your point about refugee flows, ISIS has weaponized refugee flows. We have to strike a balance between assimilating and keeping in touch with Muslim communities, but also screening these refugees as they come in. And Niall, of course, there are thousands, tens of thousands that have flooded into the region there uh, across Europe. Uh, the UK. Uh, has a general election coming up in just a matter of weeks. Uh, how do you think this does or doesn't factor in to how people are feeling there leading up to that election? Well, I think this latest terror outrage will cause, uh, you know, tremendous outrage across uh, Great Britain. Uh, it's a reminder of the fact that Britain is at war with Islamist uh, terrorists, Islamist extremists. There are several thousand. Islamists who are under police surveillance uh, at this time. There are 500 active counter-terror investigations at any one day uh, in the United Kingdom. British authorities have prevented at least 13 major terror plots over the last three years. So the scale of the challenge is absolutely vast for uh, the United Kingdom at, at, this, uh, at this stage. In terms of the, uh, of the election, I'm not sure what the direct impact will be in terms of, uh, you know, voting on June 8th, but certainly, of course, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, has projected tremendous resolve and determination, but more needs to be done in terms of combating the Islamist terror threat. We certainly need tougher laws in Britain in terms of detaining terror suspects. We need tighter border controls. Brexit, due to take place two years from now, will strengthen those border controls, make it harder for Islamists to infiltrate into the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And we do need to place really the whole country on, on a war footing uh, in terms of defeating the Islamist terror threat both at home and abroad. This is a, a war to defend our civilization, to defend our freedom against a monstrously evil threat. Yeah, and Michael, Niall brings up a, a great issue there. It's a problem here, it's a problem there, it's a problem around the globe. And the fact that right. these authorities have thousands of people they're trying to track. Investigations here, we know in the U.S. in all 50 states. I mean, how do they possibly uh, stay one step ahead? Well, those are, you know, those are defensive measures that all of our governments Have to look at and have to take a hard stance on. But my point is that, you know, we can't be right a thousand percent of the time. The terrorists only have to be right once. And, you know, we look at the number of attacks that have occurred in Europe just over the last few years, and I think you can draw a direct line to the sanctuaries that we've allowed to foster in Syria. So, you know, while we take take defensive measures, we also have to take measures to undermine this ideology of Islamic extremism. Again, to President Trump's speech in Riyadh, it has to come from within the Muslim community. And then there also has the military, informational, and economic aspects to this. This has to be a global effort across the spectrum that we have to take on, not just tougher laws and, and stricter borders at home.
All right, Michael Walls and Niall Gardner, thank you both for your uh, expertise lending us that this morning. Good to see you. Thank you. And throughout the morning, you will have continued reaction both at home and abroad to this horrific attack. Coming up, we'll ask House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy about it, as well as the president's new controversial budget proposal. And we are waiting to hear from the House Speaker this morning. As the House Intelligence Committee holds a hearing on its Russia investigation, it's going to include testimony by former CIA Director John Brennan. We'll take there live. As news continues to break overseas here at home, President Trump's first budget proposal came out this morning. The White House looking to cut more than three and a half trillion dollars in government spending over a 10-year period. That that includes $800 billion from Medicaid, a $193 billion reduction in food stamps, but Social Security and Medicare are not going to be touched. All of this hinges on a tax reform plan that no one has seen. We spoke about that and much more earlier with House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy. And Leader, before we get to the details, Details of the budget and other things we want to discuss this morning. I want to give you a chance to react to the events in Manchester from yesterday. Well, my, my thoughts and prayers go out to all those in Manchester. Um, this was a cowardice attack uh, on children as well. Uh, but this continues to show that the world is not a safe place. But we stand with England just as we done in the past and we'll be able to work through this and help them. And I know the president has offered his ongoing support, the support of the U.S. to British authorities as they try to weed through this terrible tragedy. Um, also today we are getting the president's budget. I know it's just a framework and then lawmakers take it from there. Uh, there's been a lot a lot of criticism though of cuts to Medicaid and other social programs. Um, I want to I'm going to read to you a little bit of what we're getting from the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. They say, while we appreciate the administration's focus on reducing the debt, when using more realistic assumptions, the president's budget does not add up. Relying on heroic assumptions and vague promises instead of confronting tough policy choices will not fix our country's fiscal woes. What do House lawmakers do with the proposal? Well, you exactly said it is a framework, but look at what this framework has done, much different than the budgets we had from the past president. This budget actually balances. This budget puts the priority when it comes to the military, where the military was cut for a number of years, and we look at what has transpired around the world. It also does welfare reform, helping people get back to work in the workplace. It also talks about tax reform, pro-growth, where it brings the growth rate back up into America. So that is a very good framework to start from, to be able to build on as we work through the budget process here in Congress. All right, let's talk about some of these specific cuts. Uh, $800 billion in cuts over 10 years to Medicaid, $193 billion in reduction in food stamps. Also, uh, the budget director, OMB director, Mick Mulvaney, your former uh, colleague there in the House, has said uh, that there should be a work requirement for anyone who's able-bodied and on food stamps. Um, we've heard a lot from the left that this is a heartless budget, uh, that it is benefiting the, ta uh, the rich, giving them tax breaks. Uh, at the expense of the most needy poor in our country, how do you respond to that criticism. Remember what transpired back after 1994 where Republicans took the majority and tried to remove, uh, be able to move welfare reform. They had to move it three times, be vetoed twice by President Clinton until it was finally signed. They had all the same talking points that they do today. And what happened? More people went to work. More people were, while working, were able to buy homes. and send their kids to college. This enhances the economy of America and puts more people into the workforce. And a lot of it, though, hinges on tax reform getting done. It's a heavy lift. We know you're working around the clock there uh, in the House on that potential uh, rollout. So where are we on that, and what's your time frame? Do you have one for getting something done? 
Well, this is exactly on the same time frame we had from the very beginning to do regulatory reform. which we were able to achieve, more than 14 Congressional Review Acts signed into law, the most ever. We were able to uh, then do health care reform in the House that is now moving to the Senate. And now we started on tax reform. We'll have another hearing today inside Ways and Means. This is about being fair and making it simple in the process, lowering the corporate rate. taking the seven individual rates, lowering them to three, and changing the direction of where this tax code actually works. That it, it, the current tax code pushes you to put your company in another country to have a tax advantage. If you are successful, it forces you to keep money overseas. We have more than two trillion sitting overseas that could come back into invest into America. And the current rate we currently have it gives you an advantage if you want to import instead of export uh, what you make in America. So we're transforming all that. We put it out to the American public. We're walking through the hearings today, and we'll get tax reform done this year. Well, you mentioned import-export, uh, and obviously this so-called border adjustment tax. Uh, there seems to be uh, there seem to be some critics uh, on both sides of the aisle for that concept. Uh, has the GOP coalesced around a strategy on that specific point? Are you negotiating with members? How does it work? Well, how it works is we're doing a hearing just on that today, bringing experts in that are for and against it walking it through committee, asking questions, making sure that it would work properly, that it would enhance and build more jobs into America, that it would actually reward you to bring manufacturing jobs back to America to be able to send overseas instead of rewarding those businesses that are made in other countries, get a rebate leave. their country and come into our country and compete against us uh, on a different level playing field. We want to have a level playing field out there. So that's why we're having the hearing today to walk through the border adjustment. Tax. All right, we're just about out of time, so I want to ask you quickly. Uh, back sure. in 1986, the last major substantive overhaul of uh, the tax code, there was bipartisan support. It was a bipartisan package. Will you get any Democrat votes, do you think, on what you're working up so far? I would hope that the Democrats would want to have a pro-growth um, tax code. I would hope that they wouldn't want to have the highest corporate rate in the world. I would hope that they would actually want to join with us. That's why in the hearing today, it is a bipartisan hearing. Anybody can ask a question on either side of the aisle. And we're looking forward to hearing their ideas as well as we move tax reform forward. All right, House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, thank you, sir, for your time. Good to see you. Thank you. And meanwhile, in the wake of the horrible attack in Manchester, police departments in our country are now stepping up measures to protect us. How do we stop it? Can we prevent it? We'll be live from a popular arena, Madison Square Garden. You see right there, here in New York City in a moment.